Thanks, staff. You're so nice. Um, all right, so before what I was saying when you couldn't see me or hear me was that my name is Laura and I am on the internet. Uh, my Twitter handle and <coughs> GitHub are kind of the same except a underscore. I decided at one point that Twitter was dumb and I didn't want to do it, so I deleted my account foolishly. Turns out you can't get your same username back, so <coughs> had to put the underscore in. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you about Docker. Um, and specifically, I am here to talk to you about using Ruby and Docker. And over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to hopefully answer three questions for you. The first one is containerization, what even is it? Uh, next, how can I use Docker with Ruby? And then how do I use Docker within my applications? So Docker is very popular and you've probably heard that name kind of slung, slung around. Um, Google, Spotify, Twitter, Guilt Group, Groupon, Netflix, all of these companies are using Docker and blogging about it and tweeting about it. Um, it kind of seems like some people are going a little bit crazy. Um, this is a great <laughs> kind of, um, this is kind of how I feel about it sometimes. Actually, um, Ernie brought this up at the speaker dinner last night and it is in fact in my presentation. So um, I kind of feel like people think, well, let's just put it in a container. Um, and the reason for that is Docker is really easy to use and people are experimenting with it a lot. I want to make one thing super very, very, very clear before we get started is that Docker is not a container. Docker is a tool for managing containers, but Docker itself is not a container. They're totally different things. Um, what Docker does is, is it gives you kind of the management side of containers. So not only does it execute the code inside, but it also manages kind of the images and other resources that you need in order to make containers happen. Um, and since containers are the object of manipulation um, in this containerized virtualization Docker world, first off, we're gonna talk about containers and containerization and what they even are. And then once we learn about that, we can graduate to more in-depth concepts. So containers um, are a self-contained execution environment. Doesn't that sound just so easy and nice? Um, and the truth is that containers are actually not very difficult technically to understand, but the wisdom around when and how you should use them can get a little, a little muddy. Um, so they're just a self-contained execution environment. They share the kernel of the host system. They're isolated from other containers. Um, and the one big difference is that they have very fast boot times and low overhead kind of different from a virtual machine, which has a lot of these characteristics in common. Containers are just another level of virtualization, um, but they have some kind of bigger differences that we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, and a little bit of insight into the technology that actually makes containerization, containerization and makes things isolated are um, kind of grouped into four main categories. Um, the first one is the container format. So there's a couple like uh, Linux containers, there's lib container, which is what Docker uses. There's also Rocket, and there's a bunch of other container formats that your containers can have. Um, the other three things are the ways that containers kind of draw a line in the sand, saying this is my slice of, you know, my virtual slice and this is your virtual slice. They use namespaces to isolate processes on the kernel. So your, um, like your process IDs will have a separate namespace. Um, on the opposite spectrum, there's a thing called C groups, which stands for container groups. This allows your container to be a good multi-tenant citizen on your host. If you want, you can declare that um, certain containers belong to the same C group. It's kind of a very abstract way of, of uh, explaining it, but basically they can share resources if you give them the permission to do so. And then finally, this is my very favorite part, is the file system. So Docker uses I should say containers in general use kind of a union file system. There's a couple that they can use, but this is a write on copy file system. It's super fast. Um, it's basically just kind of layers and layers and layers. Think of it as your GitHub repository. If you, there's a, you know, kind of like a point in time for each layer. So if you mess up kind of on the top three layers, you can revert back to that fourth layer and rebuild from there. There's no, you don't have to rebuild everything from start to finish. When we build our containers, um, to, or build the images to run in a container, kind of toward the end of the talk. I'm gonna do some live coding, so bear with me. Um, but we'll see kind of how this layering works. So like I said, containers are virtual, uh, you know, virtual layer. They can work in conjunction with virtual machines or completely in place of them. 
It's not one or the other. Um, you can certainly only use containers. You can certainly only use virtual machines. Most people use both of them together. Um, they might have one virtual machine that's running 10 containers. That's kind of a common workflow if you're using containers in a project. Um, and again, it is kind of like a virtual machine, but there are some things that are very, very different. Um, and to illustrate this, I have drawn you a picture um, or made blocks. So. Um, <laughs> because uh, I'm, not, I'm not a designer. But here is some blocks. This is a, if you can imagine this is an application that's running on a virtual machine. Um, this application has two instances of its web, so we can think of that as Rails, and then a database. So um, we have hardware, host OS, hypervisor, and then if you think of each of these little columns as its own um, instance of a service, so we have web, which has its libraries, guest OS, each of the columns has its own resources that are allocated to it. Um, and you'll notice we have two web, but also two libraries. They're not sharing anything. Um, with Docker, this is kind of similar with containers in general, except we'll get rid of these kind of pesky bloated parts, the hypervisor, the guest OS, and instead we'll replace it with something called a container runtime engine. So this is um, Rocket or Docker or just LXC straight um, straight from the box. And the biggest difference is that now the two instances of our web service can share the libraries um, that were previously kind of duplicated work, um, copies of the same exact thing. So now there's no, no need to do that. Of course, these are not to scale. This uh, situation here is a lot faster and takes up a lot less space than the one on the first, uh, the first slide. Um, so that's just kind of a very high-level abstract concept of how containerization is similar yet quite different from virtual machines. So still virtualization, it's still another layer of abstraction from you and the host that's actually kind of running, um, running the code, but it's really not too scary. So containers, they do have slightly more complexity, um, but the big benefit of using containers and why it's become so popular is that they reduce the amount of time and space resources needed to run your application. So if you think about how, um, if you make a bad mistake and you have to bounce your virtual machine, how long does that take you? Sometimes that can take you like three minutes, maybe five minutes. Um, I make bad mistakes all the time when I'm working because I work in research and development, which means everything is broken all the time. And it takes me, instead of five minutes every time I break something, maybe like 10 seconds. Um, and sometimes even less, sometimes less than a second to spin my services back up. So that's like, when we talk about frustration and like what makes your job good, not having to deal with restarting virtual machines all day long makes my life so much better. Um, and then also from a money perspective, like it just costs less dollars to have less resources and less time to maintain those resources. So it's kind of a win-win. Um, you would think like why doesn't everyone just use containerization, which if we talk about putting a bird on it, I feel like everyone wants to put their stuff in a container just so they can take advantage of, of this very point here. And of course, when people do start using containers, they probably do use Docker, because Docker is the most popular, it is the most accessible, it's very easy to use and kind of integrate yourself within the community and get started pretty quickly. Um, so Docker, again, not a container, rather a tool for managing containers. Um, we talked just now about kind of the execution part and how containers work functionally, like on the host, sort of low-level, extra dorky stuff. There's also another side to Docker, which is management of code. And in fact, Docker very clearly splits itself up into these two uh, capacities. One is the engine, that's the execution of code. And then the Docker Hub is the community side of things. So the Docker Hub is where you'll go for things like ideas or interesting use cases or project studies of using <coughs> containers or specifically Docker, um, news from companies, press releases, et cetera. And probably the most important thing, which is images. Um, every container starts with an image. If you think of an image um, as a class and the container is an instance of the class, it's kind of the same relationship. Images live in a thing called a registry and Docker in fact has a public registry. This is what it looks like. Um, a registry is very similar to kind of a Git, GitHub. Um, there's very tight coupling if you choose um, between your GitHub account or your company's GitHub account and the registry. If you look, um, maybe you can't see this, but right here it says official repositories. If you are very lazy, like I am, um, these are repositories, these are images that you can put into a container and run them that are maintained by other people. So if you want to start, um, if you want to make an application using Docker containers or containerized components, this is a great place to start. You don't have to write a single line of code. 
you might have to do some configuring. You might have to set some environment variables or forward ports and get things talking to one another. But for example, if you wanted to use, um, if you wanted to start a WordPress site, you can pull down WordPress and pull down the database of your choice, get them to talk to each other without having actually to touch the WordPress source code at all. It's really fast and kind of powerful, especially if you're just kicking the tires with something new. A very typical use case, um, I forgot who I was talking to about this earlier, but um, Elasticsearch running in a container and pre-configured and you just kind of start it in a container and it lives by itself somewhere else. Um, it's always going to be the same for every project. It's a great way to handle dependencies like that. Um, and the official repositories are kind of what you would want to use for a case where you're just running a service as part of an application. But of course, the good part is using Ruby and Docker. Um, so before we get into kind of images, containers using Ruby, uh, we have to install Docker first. So this can be a pain, a little bit. Docker does get a lot of flack from some people that it's just too many layers of abstraction and it's too hard and blah, 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 whatever complaining people want to do about it. Um, you can't, I don't think, tweet from Vim. It's just, it's just not a thing. But the sentiment, it can ring true. Um, and in fact, when you use Docker, if you are on Linux, great. But if you're not, like most of us in this room probably have Macs that we use as our main machine, you have to install a virtual machine on your Mac that you can run Docker on. So there's a couple ways that this has been made a lot easier for you. Um, the, my weapon of choice is boot to Docker. And I think that if you're starting out with Docker, you should probably use it too. It is, it, what boot to Docker will do is set up a very, like a, a tiny Linux virtual machine on your box, sync all of your folders for you. It will appear as if you are just natively using Docker on your Mac. I'm going to demo a lot of stuff with Docker a little bit later. I am using boot to Docker. I'm not like, I don't have Linux running on my machine. I'm just using boot to Docker. It will appear as if I am using Docker directly on my Mac, but I am not. So um, don't be confused. I've, I've gotten some questions from people about how Docker in their virtual machine can talk to Docker on their Mac and how that works. And then I realized I had done a really bad job of explaining things. So if you see me use Docker, I'm using boot to Docker. Um, there's also a thing called Kitematic, which Docker just acquired and kind of launched as part of their project. It's a GUI for Mac. So if you would prefer to work with a GUI to, to kind of manage your resources, you can certainly do that. Um, I, I just got used to boot to Docker, so that's what I'm going to use today. But it's certainly an option for you. Um, so then speaking of interacting with Docker and spinning up your virtual machine, you'll see me work a lot with the CLI. That's how we're going to do most of the basic stuff. Um, Docker also does have a REST API. So if you do need to write custom tooling, if you're using Docker kind of as a bigger feature within a different project, that's available to you as well. We have our own client wrappers, et cetera, um, for the projects I work on. And both the CLI and the API have excellent documentation. You can find it at docs.docker.com. So once we have Docker installed and we can kind of think about interacting with it, um, this is our goal. We want to talk to Whale which talks to computer, which makes boxes happen. So how does that, how does that work? Um, and everything starts with an image. The image is the very first thing that you are going to touch to configure when you start working with Docker um, in your application. So as I said before, right, each container is kind of an instance of this image that you create. And an image is controlled by a Docker file. So you kind of have Docker file turns into an image, and then an image turns into a container. And there are a couple of ways to get, um, to get images. If you have your own Docker file, you can build your image um, yourself using the Docker CLI by saying docker build dash T stands for tag. Um, usually, you give it this format, foo bar, where foo is your GitHub username, and then bar is the name of the image. So for example, I work for CenturyLink, so most of our images are CenturyLink slash RubyBase or CenturyLink slash, um, I don't know, Panamax uh, UI project. And then this little period is very important. That's the directory that you're building from or that's where your Docker file lives. So usually it's the directory that you're in. If it's somewhere else, you just have to tell it to do that. Um, and then as I said before, this Docker pull is interacting with the Docker registry. So if you want to pull down Redis or you want to pull down Postgres, you would say Docker pull Postgres, et cetera, Docker pull Rails. You can do 
you can do those things. Um, these, you won't actually see the Docker file. You won't have to have it on your computer. It's already been kind of, you can, you can look at it on the hub, but you don't have to interact with the Docker file. For this build kind, um, this way, you do have to have the Docker file on your system. So before we kind of get further into images, I want to make a point incredibly clear. This is super important. In fact, so important that I had to write very important in German to get people to really pay attention to it. There are two different kinds of images that you'll find on the hub. So be very careful and make sure you read the documentation for whatever you're pulling down. There are things called static images, which are what you want when you're first starting out. Static images have, that's the bundle, that's like the ready for deployment version of the service. So like Redis or Postgres or MongoDB or whatever you're using, you want to pull the static image down. That's something that's ready to be shipped. There are also what I like to call dynamic images or kind of development images. These are not ready to be shipped. They don't really function without the supporting files. Like it's not the bundle. It's just kind of the skeleton and you need to insert the files to make it work. This is especially helpful when you're developing. Of course, you don't want to have to package and build code every time you make a change to a text file. That's not really that fun. Um, so you'll use this dynamic way. Um, but if you're looking for a dependency, you probably don't really want a dynamic service because you have to write, you kind of have to roll your own then. So just be mindful of what kind of service you're pulling down from the registry, what kind of image you're pulling down from the registry. Um, so without further ado, let's build some images. Um, this is an example of that static way that I just talked about. So here is an example Docker file. Um, I'm going to go through each one of these kind of line by line. Um, but Docker files can take a little bit of a long time to build. Um, so I want to build this image. Thus commences the live coding portion of my talk. <laughs> so I'm in a, can you guys see that all right? Is that okay? Um, so I'm in a Hello World um, application. I have just a couple things in here. It's a little Sinatra application that will just print out Hello World in a browser um, in Helvetica, white background with black text as my designer would have wanted. So um, we can look at the Docker file. It's actually the same one as I just showed you. It's just a couple lines. Um, just gonna do some stuff. I'm gonna build this. Let me. Um, so docker build slash t, and we'll give this the name hello world, and then a dot because I'm in the directory that I wanna build from. And, oh, that was really fast. Um, all right, so you can see that every single one of these steps kind of added its own um, unique identifier for the layer. So this is the layered file system. Um, so this is built and that's great. I'm gonna go through and kind of explain what each of these things did um, and then we'll come back to this and actually run the thing in a container. Very impressed by the internet speed. That was blazing fast. Um, all right, so the first thing that this Docker file did is, is, it, was, it, was, it was building this image, um, is pull down a base image. So everything starts with from. Uh, there is a thing called scratch that does exist. Scratch is usually included in whatever you will reference as your base file. You'll probably never ever write uh, an image that is based on scratch or built from scratch. So it, it exists kind of, you know, there has to be a base image for the base image. That's what it is. Um, but you probably don't have to use it. So this is a Ruby base image that has version 212. So if I want a different version, I can just kind of swap out that tag. Um, the next thing is the maintainer. This is pretty straightforward. It's like if someone or something breaks and you need to email someone angrily, uh, that's the person to do it. Uh, other things you can do in a Docker file is expose ports. So this is not a port binding. You're not actually binding it to another port. You're just kind of advertising that this service is available on whatever port. If you want to have it available in a browser, you need some other kind of configuration. You need to do that in a, in a separate place, which I'll show you. Um, but this is sometimes really helpful, even if you intend that the service will be run with a port, explicit port mapping or port binding, just to give the user kind of a hint as to what they should expect to look for. And then the next set of commands are kind of the bread and butter of this image. 
Um, this is the actual packaging and shipping of the code that, that I worked on. So the first thing I'm going to do in my container is make a directory. And in that app directory, I'm going to add everything from my current directory into the directory that I just made. So if you remember when I was in my terminal and I showed you all the junk that was in that folder, this command, this add, is adding all that junk to here. So I'm copying everything from my host machine, from my laptop, my project files, into the container. Once that happens, I can't touch it anymore. So this is not great if it's something that you're actively developing on. Otherwise, you have to do this every single time you make a change, which is really not fun, even if it is really fast. The next thing I'm going to do is execute a couple commands. Um, actually, I'm going to execute one command, which is my bundle install. But before I do that, I have to tell the container where it should kind of execute the commands. Um, so I'm going to set a working directory or workdir to that app folder that I had just made and just copied all my stuff to. There is a gem file in there. I'm just going to run a bundle install. Um, it's very important to note that these, much like um, a lot of other kind of document languages, is read top to bottom. So if I were to run bundle install before setting my work there, Docker would be like, what are you doing? Um, because it wouldn't, have, it, you know, it wouldn't have the gem file to run. So just make sure that you're doing everything in the right order, and that order is top to bottom in your, in your Docker file. And then finally, we're going to start this uh, little Sinatra application by issuing a command. There's also a thing called entry point. Um, they have differences. It's very kind of negligible. Generally, just use command. Um, but you may see entry point if you're looking at other documentation. So I'm just going to enter the container with the command ruby hello world.rb. A couple other things that are important to note um, that you probably will see. Uh, one of them is called env. E -N -V. Um, it kind of looks funny. The key, this is not part of the, um, the Docker file command. It's just env. But the key has to be in all caps. So if I wanted to give like password is like puppies or something, I would say password in all caps and then puppies in lowercase. Um, the next one is volume mounting. So if you are doing the dynamic kind of development and you want to mount your file system as a volume into the container, this is the command that you'll use. So you can either do it in the Docker file. There's a way to do it at runtime, which I'll show you in just a little bit. But this basically just creates a mount point so that you can get your files that you're working on into the container. This is great for development because if you do this, you probably didn't bundle and copy things. So this is very dynamic. You can actively code and have the changes reflected without having to restart and rebundle and reinstall everything in the container. Um, and before we start this, I just want to revisit this from command. So it has a little gold star. There is no need for gem management, version management, no management is needed inside of a container because you just put it, whatever you want inside of it. If you want uh, 212, you can make that your base image. If you want to change version, you don't have to go in there and like futz around with version management. Just change your Docker file and rebuild it, and it will just be there for you. Um, this is especially great, like the gem set management thing is such a pain. So I find myself kind of having different containers for whatever gem set that I'm using instead of using RVM or, or yeah, whatever kind of management tool that I feel like. So this is another way that Docker can kind of do cool things to help your development life be a little bit easier. Um, so let's take a look at running something in a container. Um, <coughs> Cool. So the way to check what images you have, simply by typing Docker images. Um, you'll notice that I have two images that are identical. Um, and they, are, in fact, have the same ID. Um, and that's why it was so fast. Uh, remember I said it's a layered file system. So if Docker knows that the work is done, it's been done already, it doesn't do it again, because that would be dumb, right? So it had seen that I had already made this image called Sad Times, because sometimes, um, especially the bundle install, will fail during a live demo. And it's very uncomfortable, both for me and the audience. So I have learned to kind of uh, make a backup that I usually call Sad Times, because I only have to use it in Sad Times. But <coughs> thankfully, um, <laughs> it appeared that kind of everything Everything worked. Um, so we'll, we'll, run, we'll run the hello world. We don't want to be sad. Um, 
So we'll run this container very simply by saying docker run. Um, and I said before that I have an exposed port, but I don't actually have a port binding. I need to make one from the container to the virtual machine. Um, if you're using a virtual machine, you might also have to make a port rule from the virtual machine to your host. Thankfully, boot to Docker gives you the host, um, the IP address of your virtual machine, so I'm just going to use that. I could use localhost, I would just need to set up a, a port binding rule on my virtual machine. Um, but I'm going to bind 4567 to 4567 so that I can get from the container to the boot to Docker instance that's running on my machine. And I'm just going to run this image called Hello World, and we should see my app start. So that's reassuring. And I just started a container and ran my web application. So that happened, I mean, it took me longer to switch tabs or switch windows and open it up in the browser than it did for everything to, to fire up. Um, so that's really cool, but if I want to change uh, anything, I can't do it because I already, um, I already packaged it up. So I want to just very quickly show you um, the way that you'll probably work with Docker if you are working in a development environment, which I think we're all developers here, so that's probably the, the more likely thing that we're going to do. Um, if we look at the Docker images again, we can see that my base image is actually called out as a, its own separate thing, and that's exactly what we expect. Whenever you have a from statement in your Docker file, Docker treats that kind of as its own separate entity and will give it its own unique identifier and its own little house in your, um, in your file system. So I have access to Docker, this, this image, kind of independently from all the stuff that I added to it um, after the from command. So if I'm going to do dynamic uh, development or I'm you know, working on a project, I can actually just run the base image kind of as the skeleton or as the bucket to hold my project and manually start and link um, the stuff that I'll need to get all of my files into the container and then to run them. So I just need to remind myself what directory I'm in here. So I'm going to do a little bit of magic. Um, but it's not that bad, I promise. So first, I'm going to um, just link this folder. So that volumes command that we just saw in the Docker file, I'm going to do the same thing, equivalent, the equivalency on the run string, um, and that's dash v. So I'm in a folder called concat hello world, um, and then I'm going to put a colon, and I'm just going to make a directory in the um, the container called like var app. I don't know. That sounds good to me. Um, I need the same port binding rule. Um, let's see. Yes. Container. Am I going to have a conflict here? I think I need to do this. And then my image. Um, oh crap. Sorry. One other thing. I usually copy and paste these commands because they're a pain. Um, but I wanted to see you guys, or have you guys see me sort of struggle with it, because it is not very, I mean, it's stable enough to use in production. But I use this every day, and to me, sometimes I'm still mystified as to how this thing works. So don't feel bad if you spend like an hour banging your head against a wall. Like, I'm probably doing the same thing, and this is my job. So don't, don't feel, um, you know, underqualified or anything. I'm adding this IT so that I can have um, a TTY session. I'm going to drop into this as bin bash. So, oh crap, wait, why'd that happen? Oh, I know. I'm relying on my, hey, okay, cool. Um, I'm like, so, I'm so happy that it worked. Um, okay. So this is the dynamic way, and um, can you guys see that in the back? I'm sorry. So some kind of the magic juju that I just did was this dash V was copying everything from my host, from my laptop, which again, if we remember, boot to Docker syncs it into that virtual machine. So in actuality, I'm copying things that were in the virtual machine into a container. I'm mounting it as a volume. So now my container has access to the files that are in my virtual machine. I'm running it in interactive mode and just kind of dropping in um, into a bash session 
I also did some port uh, binding goodness so that hopefully after I run um, a bundle install, it worked. Uh, I can just say Ruby hello world.rb. Okay. This is going well so far. Hey, okay, cool. So that didn't look any different <laughs> because I didn't actually change anything. Um, but if we go into the same folder and go, I'm just doing this for simplicity. Um, oh man, okay. Sorry, I'll open a new tab and do it in Vim. Um, <laughs> all right. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna go in here and change this. So I am changing a file that is on my laptop, not in the virtual machine. This is like my local file system. Um, I'm gonna change it to this. I'm gonna save it. And then I should be able to go back here and have it change. Okay, so this is how you're gonna use Docker in development. So um, your response is a little underwhelming. I'm a little disappointed. Oh, crap. Oh. There. Oh. <laughs> There's always one thing. Last time I gave a demo, I like typoed the port number and it like didn't work. And some guy was like, you switched the numbers. And I'm like, thanks man. Um, all right. <laughs> okay, cool. So um, me in standing in front of you, high pressure situation, being tape recorded, I was able to get my development environment working in a container. I promise it's really not that hard. If I can do it with all of you watching me and being video recorded, you can do it at home on your laptop, like with some coffee or a beer. So, um, so that's running kind of development stuff um, in a container. So this is all great. And let me turn mirroring back on so I can have my developer notes. Okay, cool. So that was running a uh, development container uh, with my Sinatra application in it. If you're using Ruby, there's a couple um, official images that you can use if you want to cre recreate that magic in your own life. Um, there are official Ruby images that are up on the Docker Hub. And I think there's support for like 193. I don't know what patch level, but it kind of it goes back that way. You'll get to it by saying Docker pull Ruby whatever tag that you want, um, and then the repositories usually include really really great instructions for bootstrapping or kind of instructions on how you will integrate that code into your project. Um, the Ruby images are probably more of these dynamic type images that you saw me use just now. They're not really the static type images, right? It's just kind of a set of instructions to get you up and running, but not necessarily like a deliverable service that you'll run. There's also a couple gems that you can use when you are developing. Um, so Swipely uses Docker pretty heavily and they've written a, a pretty good Docker API gem. That's what I use uh, every day. So. You can interact with the Docker API for your Ruby application. And at the time that I wrote this slide, I did a, a search on Ruby gems, and there were like over 30 other gems that had something to do with Docker. This was probably a couple months ago. I imagine now it's maybe more like 50. So um, people are writing stuff to, to integrate with Docker. It's pretty widely supported now. People are using it a lot more. So it shouldn't be too hard to kind of choose a tool that's right for you. Um, but the one thing that we need to talk about in a little heart to heart is debugging in a container. And I'm just really sorry, but it's, it's not that fun. Um, it's not my fault. So <laughs> what you can do is use Pry, which most of us use anyway, um, or at least I, I don't want to speak for everyone. I use Pry. Um, if you are new to Pry or maybe you just need a refresher because you haven't used it in a while, you just require it and then you can call it within some method and when you're executing it will stop and you'll have access to all these fancy things that you can do. Um, the cool thing about using Pry is that you really don't need a remote session. If you are running in interactive mode, like I did when I was modifying the files, I was dropped in a bash session and I had access, like I could just like, right, I had access to the, the container, so it will just function and feel like you're running it on your own machine, um, but it has to be in interactive mode. If you're running it as a dependency or kind of the first way that I ran a container, you don't have access um, to like a to a session, so you can't. You it doesn't really work. Just make sure that you're using kind of the right kind of container, which is the dynamic way when you're trying to do debugging. Um, Alternatively, you could also use the pry command. So we ran the container just before by saying ruby hello world.rb. Um, 
and that was CMD in the Docker file. You can also, um, you, you saw me drop in as bin bash, you could drop in as the pry command itself. So you would say docker run whatever your image was and then pry at the end of it would drop you into the container um, in a pry session. There's a couple other things that you'll need to do. It's documented pretty well, so um, I hate to say it, but like Google it if you're interested in doing it. I'm happy to explain it to you um, afterward. It's, it's not super complicated. So finally, we have learned how to make Docker files, turn Docker files into images, turn images into containers. We've learned two different ways of starting a container and interacting with our own file system and developing with containers. Um, but the hard part, is really the application architecture with Docker. And this is where most people get tripped up and this is probably where you're gonna spend the most of your time thinking about Docker and thinking about containers if you are using Docker um, in, in your next project. And kind of simply put, maybe a little too simply put, but Docker architecture is a service-oriented or microservice architecture. Um, and the whole point of Docker is that they are fast, small, and cheap. So, if you think about what that gets you, of course it makes sense to have many instances of the same service running across a distributed system. That's what Docker kind of is meant to do. Um, if a service fails, you'll get a new one in milliseconds. There are lots of tools that will help you with service discovery or managing your distributed system. Google has Kubernetes, there's Marathon and Mesos, Amazon has its container management service. There's container management services popping up all over the place but they don't really work well if you have a monolithic application. So it may seem really tempting with this Docker file to just dump everything in there. Don't do that because it does, you're not really any better off than if you had just dumped everything into a virtual machine. If the container fails, your whole application still fails. You're not getting that um, kind of nimbleness that Docker will let you, let you have. So let's look at what maybe a Rails application uh, might look like. One service and one container. Each service has its own image, its own configuration <coughs> options, and we talk, or we get them to talk to one another a variety of ways. The most basic way is by linking them together. So this is a um, little link here. It's actually like a Docker link. It's sort of a, it's a feature of, of Docker. Uh, we're saying that web is dependent on database. So until database is running, and if database is not running, web cannot run. Um, it's just kind of declaring a strong dependency there. You'll notice there's also a couple other things, like we're exposing a port on the database and making a binding on the website so that we can see it in the browser. There's lots of other configuration that can happen. That's just a very basic example. And this configuration can happen in two places. Um, first is the Docker file which we saw before, we baked all the config options in there, we copied files, we exposed a port, we did a bunch of crap. Um, you can also do it in the Docker run string, which when I ran this container for the second time, I did my volume mounting there, I did a port binding there, um, I specified some other config options like interactive mode, et cetera, in that run string itself. Um, and actually, if you are using Docker heavily and you're sharing images back and forth, that's the kind that you wanna do, that's the kind of development you wanna do. Configure it at runtime because you want your images to be as portable as possible. You can never know what someone else is gonna use your image for. And if you bake stuff in and package it up, you might be disallowing someone to use the code that you've written in their own project, which to me just is a mean thing to do. So don't do that, be nice. Um, so let's go back to this application and kind of look at maybe where these configuration, configuration options are best and where they're better and where they're not good and things that you shouldn't do. So if we look at the web, uh, the web service, this is actually almost identical to the service that we just spun up before. So we have a Docker file that has maintainer, we're making a directory, copying things into the directory, running bundle install, and then um, this is just a slightly different syntax for running that command. You could just also say without, um, without the brackets, just as a string Ruby app.rb. Um, you'll notice though that this stuff is runtime. So before we kind of had the example that expose was in the Docker file, it's actually maybe not the best thing. Um, we really need a port binding, that stuff you can't even do in the Docker file. There's also a link here at runtime. You don't wanna specify a dependency in the Docker file. You don't know if someone's gonna be running this with a dependency or not, and you shouldn't dictate that for them. Um, just let them kind of decide for themselves at runtime. They can always configure it themselves. Um, one thing that I wanna share that's not here uh, is this, 
Actually, sorry, there should be a equal sign in between. Um, don't put credentials in a Docker file. Just don't do it because these this gets pushed onto the public registry in most cases. So you'll just have, like I've seen a lot, um, you know, people commit accidentally their private SSH keys to GitHub sometimes. Not on purpose, but it just happens. Um, the same thing kind of happens, like OpenStack credentials are very common to be accidentally included in a Docker file, and that Docker file finds its way onto the Docker Hub, and suddenly you have like a million dollars worth of um, like uh, charges from whatever hosting service you're using because someone got your credentials is like running a bunch of things um, as you. So don't do that, it's a bad pattern. It's really easy to kind of think like, oh, I'm just gonna put all my config stuff in a Docker file. That is what runtime is for. So don't put um, environment passwords or any other sensitive information in the Docker file. Dash E is how you'll do it at runtime. Um, and this is kind of exactly how you would do it. Uh, again, there's that port mapping the environment variable and then the link. Links take the format of name alias, so in this case I'm just alias, aliasing my <coughs> service called db to db, um, and then finally of course the image that we're running is at the very end. Um, a couple things about this way of doing things, right? Um, each container has to be run with its own Docker run string, and you can only start one container at a time via the CLI, but you can start multiple containers from the same image. So there's kind of a one-to-many ratio between images and containers, um, but again, you can only start one of them at a time, and of course, find the balance between the Docker run and configuring at runtime versus the Docker file. And if starting containers one at a time seems like a lot of tedious work to you, good news. Um, there's a thing called application templating and it will change your life for the better if you are a regular user of Docker. So with application templating, you can use your own images or images from the Docker registry. You specify your config options beforehand and then instead of kind of tediously going through every container that you're starting and running um, it by hand, you run the application template instead. Usually it's just one command. And there's a couple tools that will get you started with this. The first one is Docker's tool called Docker Compose. It used to be called Fig. They were kind of integrated into Docker proper. Now they're called Docker Compose, which I like, but also Fig is much shorter, so I don't like it. Um, the good thing about using Docker Compose is that it is a Docker project now, so its standards are tightly coupled with Docker. There's not gonna be a big difference between stuff you can do in Docker Compose and stuff that you can do with Docker. It's gonna be the same, which is really helpful. Some third-party tools can get a little out of sync and it can be kind of frustrating for a little bit. With Docker Compose, you'll dump all your requirements into a YAML file, which is called Docker Compose, or Docker hyphen compose.yaml, and then you run it with Docker Compose up it's very similar, very, it kind of feels the same as doing Foreman up or whatever kind of resource management tool that you use. And all the installation instructions, anything that you could possibly ever want is available uh, on the documentation site. Uh, there's also this really, really cool, super fancy, maintained by lovely people project, open source project called Panamax, which is a Ruby project. And it is a Docker workflow tool. It is similar to Docker Compose in that you can make an application template, but it is different in the fact that it is a GUI as well. Um, itself is a containerized application. Panamax runs a C advisor container, a API container, and a UI container. And we use a bunch of kind of peripheral Docker tools in order to make it happen. Um, CoreOS, Fleet, etcd, etc. These are all tools that work with Docker that if you use Docker a lot, you will probably have to know at least a little bit about them. Um, Panamax will never lie to you about what these tools are doing, but it makes it so that you don't necessarily have to touch them right away. And panamax.io is our website. You can check it out. A couple things to note is that Panamax and Docker Compose is very easy to kind of go back and forth. We did that on purpose because we don't want to preclude someone from using Docker Compose if they started out on Panamax. Similarly, if you started with Docker Compose and want to use Panamax instead, you can do that. Um, Panamax supports remote deployment. So if you have an application template and you have it in Panamax and you want to deploy it to AWS, you can do it by pressing a button one button. Of course, you have to like configure it beforehand and give it your token, but after that, it's a button to put it on AWS, which is mind blowing, right? I know, I helped write it, so. Um, <laughs> it is, in fact, also, we use Go in a lot of Ruby. It's mostly Ruby. It's open source. If you guys are interested in learning a little bit more about Docker or interested in contributing to a project, 
Panamax is nice and we're all nice people and we get along very well. So um, very quickly, kind of before we wrap up, just a very short example of what an application template might look like. So this is a Rails with Postgres and we have a description and then this stands for I cut out a lot of stuff because it was really long. And basically all it is is a list of your images. So with each image you can give it a couple things like category, name, um, the source is the image. So on the Docker Hub, if you look at my repository, I have a Rails image. So I'm just going to use that image. Um, and I can give it some options like expose, which I'm not exposing anything. But I can bind ports and I can specify links. So in this case, I want to link it to my database and give my database an alias. No environment variables, no mounted volumes, pretty cut and dry. Um, but I can run that if I'm in Panamax. I can just press a button and have it show up in my browser and kind of do all the configuration for me. If I want to use this in Docker Compose, I can do that as well and just type Docker Compose up and then do a little bit more kind of command line tweaking and, and get it running. So that is um, Docker in a nutshell. Hopefully I've convinced you that it's really not scary and hard and evil, but in fact very pleasurable and nice and can make your development process and your, your time as a developer during the day so much more productive and cheaper. Uh, a couple things kind of to leave you with, use boot to Docker if you're getting started. Also Kitematic is great, Panamax is great if you're just getting started. Um, but I like to tinker on the command line before I start using a GUI. Personally that's how I learn better, so boot to Docker is great. Um, the base images are really powerful. If you can extract things into a base image, um, similar to that Ruby base image that I demoed, you can save yourself a lot of re repetition. Um, don't include credentials in your Docker file. And then also use application templating. It makes your life a lot easier and a lot faster, especially if you have the same config for most of the projects that you work on. If you're a consultant or you're doing kind of a lot of the same dependencies for projects, you can just put it in an application template and every time you start a new project, just fire it up with Docker Compose up and you have all your dependencies ready. Um, I'm gonna leave this slide up for you to take pictures of or jot down whatever you want, some additional resources. Um, and thank you all for being very attentive and hopefully I have taught you a little bit about Docker today.